grateful today to be a creative. Hi everyone, I'm Lori Fagan and welcome to AZ Creates, a web series about the many creative people right here in the state of Arizona. On today's show, you'll meet an amazing graphite or pencil artist, Jack Schilder, in our Creative Connection segment. And in What Are You Reading? An important but rather challenging subject about suicide with author Sandy Roberts. You won't want to miss it. AZ Creates is sponsored by Mary Contreras State Farm Insurance. A longtime supporter of the arts, Contreras offers insurance for autos, homeowners, renters, personal, business, life, and health, plus annuities and mutual funds. Located in Tempe, contact Mary Contreras through her website at marycontreras.com. In our Creative Connection segment today, we'd like you to meet Jack Schilder, an amazing graphite or pencil artist. Welcome to the show, Jack. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So glad that we could. Now, Jack, you have lived all around the world. You were born in Holland. You spent your uh, young life in South Africa. And then you said you picked up a pencil first when you were about eight or nine years old. Where were you living there? And what drew you to the lovely pencil? Well, actually, uh, I was born in Holland, like you said, and I've lived there for three years, first three years of my life. Then my parents decided to move to South Africa for two years. And from there, we went to uh, northern Rhodesia, which is now Zambia, for eight years. And that's where I started drawing. Um, I was doing a lot of copying pictures out of books, and uh, I just had a, a fascination with uh, drawing with pencil. That's great. At such a young age, too, it's wonderful. Then you said you later moved to New Jersey, and that's where you spent a lot of your young adult life anyway, and you got into design engineering. Uh, what actually is design engineering, and how did that relate, or did it, to your art at all? I was in design engineering for uh, about 40 years and uh, for various different um, companies, pharmaceutical, uh, petrochem, food, you name it, I, I've done it. And uh, yeah, that's is not related to my artwork at all, really. You know, I've just been doing this for such a long time that it was kind of a stress reliever for me. That's what it was, you know, coming ah. out stressful environment for 40 years so that makes perfect sense absolutely so what brought you to uh scottsdale then and uh and now uh cave creek specifically well my wife and i decided we needed a change and we just kind of packed up our bags and moved out here and uh, have never regretted it and then scottsdale first and uh, i was still working at the time and uh, we had to go to Indiana after about 15 years living here. And my wife didn't want to go, but I, I convinced her to go. And um, yeah, I said, it'll only be for three years that I'll retire. And that ended up being eight years. And yeah, so finally we came back about six, about six years ago. Good. Glad to have you back here because you do tend to work in a lot of Southwest themes now, correct? Correct. When we first moved out here to Arizona, that's when I started getting into the uh, the southwestern type uh, art that I, I just absolutely love the Southwest. And uh, one of my biggest influences was James Bama. I just absolutely love the guy's work, and uh, that's what I've been doing ever since. So we're going to take a look at uh, a number of your images, and this first one is called "Get Along." Describe it and tell us a little bit about it. That's my most recent piece. Uh, as I was actually telling somebody, uh, I, I try to stay away from drawing rope, water, and uh, drapery. Yeah, I don't like drawing it too much. And th this particular piece has all three. So, <laughs> But uh, yeah, it, it's probably one of my favorite pieces. It, it is spectacular, it really is. And now in your bio, you say you like to evoke emotions and tell a story. Uh, we want to take a look at your piece called Music Box and tell us a little bit more about how you decided to create this piece. 
this piece just, the idea for this piece just popped into my head all of a sudden. It was something different. And uh, I thought about this for a long time. And um, the most difficult part of doing this piece was finding the uh, reference material for this. And it, it's the, the way I work, I work with great detail. Um, I had a real problem. So I ended up photographing myself for the three figures, basically from the waist up to about the face. They're all me with subtle changes. That's very interesting. Great way to, to do that. Um, now, you say you work primarily in black and white, but you have this one piece called Yellow Slicker. When do you decide to add color, like in this one? That piece was all, you know, just pencil originally, and uh, it was kind of bland, and I decided to add the yellow to the slicker, and it just kind of popped. And uh, it actually, that piece actually won a competition. The uh, Kiwanis uh, organization, they had a, uh, a competition. They were looking for a label for wine bottles, their wine bottles. They, they had uh, a winery, you know, do about 500 bottles and, and that the uh, Kiwanis organization would give away. And I entered that competition and I won. So that particular piece is on about 500 wine bottles. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a fun Fun thing to know and to have that around. Absolutely. Now, you did mention about your detail, and I've been fortunate enough to see your piece in person up close, where again, the detail is so astounding. Uh, when you had your work at El Pedregal Gallery, down to the veins and really tiny, tiny details. Now, do you work from photos? You mentioned about taking photos of yourself. Do you work from uh, some from memory as well, or, or what are the reference materials you usually use? I work. Definitely from photographs. Some of the photographs are my own, or I, I, I do a lot of research. And uh, But I'm familiar with a lot of the uh, subject matter that I draw, so I make up a lot of the stuff also. We talked about uh, the pencils that you work with specifically. Um, and, and tell us about some of the favorite kinds of pencils that you work with. I use uh, mechanical pencils, uh, 2H and uh, HB mostly. And some of the darker areas, I go into the softer leads up to probably 6B. So, Jack, how has the pandemic affected uh, your art and just your world these days? Well, I, I am retired, so um, I do show my work at the gallery at El Pedregal. And I've shown at the Holland House and at the, uh, the Stagecoach facility. Um, sales have been a little slower. Um, I do sell off my website also. So, but uh, I've noticed that, uh, you know, things have slowed down a bit as far as my sales. Sure. And you will be in Hidden in the Hills, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, a person from probably one of my favorite studios contacted me right, at, right after the last Hidden in the Hills and uh, asked me to join them. And I was just overwhelmed. That was, I thought that was I died and went to heaven. It's a great studio. <laughs> That's terrific. Well, and uh, we will all be having the Sonoran Arts League as our featured nonprofit uh, this uh, this episode. So uh, we'll be telling more people about uh, Hidden in the Hills as well. So you can find more information about Jack at his website at jackshilderart.com. And that's S-C-H-I-L-D-E-R dot com jack .com. thank you again for joining us today jack continued good uh good luck with all of your artwork thank you very much laurie i appreciate you having me on your show coming up a chat with author and clinical psychologist sandy roberts about preventing suicide stay with us az creates is sponsored by sibley's west the Chandler and Arizona gift shop in historic downtown Chandler. A strong supporter of Arizona creatives, Sibley's West features work from more than 200 artists specializing in Arizona items and souvenirs, including art, pottery, food, jewelry, and much more. Now open at 72 South San Marcos Place in Chandler, online shopping is also available with convenient and safe curbside pickup. Visit www sibleyswest.com for details. We have a rather serious subject to talk about in our What Are You Reading segment. It's about suicide. And if you are not in a comfortable place to hear this, we certainly understand. 
On the other side is our guest, Sandy Roberts, will tell us it is time to, quote, unravel the many misconceptions about suicide. We'd like you to meet author Sandy Roberts. Sandy, welcome to AZ Creates. Oh, thanks, Lori. I'm so honored to be here. You are so welcome. Now, you have been in the crisis and behavioral health field for more than 25 years. You have a master's degree in clinical psychology and are certified as a master trainer of trainers in suicide prevention and intervention. You've been revising your guidebook, which I saw many years ago on mm -hmm. suicide prevention, where you say in this guidebook that suicide is not about wanting death, but then why do some people take their lives? To make the pain go away, Lori. Sometimes they have so much pain and so much challenge and they don't know what to do with it. And they end up thinking, if I just didn't wake up in the morning or if I just didn't have to deal with this, everything would be so much easier. And when that happens, suicide just gets on the menu. It's like, oh, you know, I could do this, I could do that, I could end my life. And it gets on a very, very tragically sad menu. Now, I've watched this for so many years, and it's so tragic. And it is a tough subject for a lot of people to talk about, too. We can't even bring ourselves, it seems like, to, to discuss it when it is either a problem for somebody personally or when somebody is questioning whether or not a family member or a friend. Why is that? Sometimes it's because they don't want to hear the answer because they're not sure what to do if they had that answer. And so they're, they're, and they're afraid to bring it up because they think it's going to give them the idea to do it. Uh, that's probably the number one reason that people are afraid to talk about it. And what they really, really, I would love to see them do instead is to be able to say, you know, I'm a little worried. I have noticed that things really suck for you right now. You're having a hard time. I'm just wondering, are things so bad that you're thinking that suicide might be a solution? That's a great way to phrase it. Now, with the upcoming holidays, this can be a very challenging time. What may be going through some people's minds as we're going into Thanksgiving and Christmas uh, and then the new year and then on top of the whole COVID pandemic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we have so much going on right now. It's, it's almost insurmountable and, that, and it's almost impossible to keep track of everything that's happening. Um, sometimes people will set if things don't change by types of dates like so if if things aren't better by christmas you know then i'm just going to end it all if things aren't better by new year if things aren't better by my birthday if things aren't better by an anniversary of some sort so they'll sort of like set a date out there and unfortunately they're really looking for what's wrong rather than what's right in their life while they're looking at, hmm, okay, well, I'm getting closer to that date. Nothing's changed. I have no reason to go on. I see. Very interesting. Now, you talked about, we want to talk about some of the warning signs for friends and family to look for. You said there's actually like 14, right? So let's talk yes. about those warning mm -hmm. signs for friends and family. Okay. So, yeah, you can change the order of them to fit your situation or any situation, but here's basically some of the things that happen. Okay, moral injury. That is when something has happened that is so bad that we just don't want to face going forward. When someone has done something to us, we've done something that we're ashamed of. And um, if, if you look at the military, that sense of, you know, taking out lives to save lives is a really hard one to deal with. Now, um, Post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, trauma that is so awful, just so awful, that it, it just seems like it's in a never-ending cycle in your head. You're, you're just trying to figure out, how do I deal with this? And again, we're focusing on what's going wrong 
and we forget to look for what's going right. Personal relationships. Oh my, let me tell you. And uh, it, it, I swear if I had a nickel for every time somebody said, if this person doesn't love me or if this person doesn't do this, you know, I'm just going to end my life. And let me tell you, there is no one else out there that is worth you taking your life. In fact, if they're so unkind to you, stay and make them miserable. Don't give up. Don't get out of the way. Not just get even. In, in personal relationships, we put so much judgment value on our worth. What is, what is our worth? What are we doing that makes us worthwhile? And we worry about that and we question it. Uh, yeah, they make movies about it. Uh, so don't just focus on, I did this, it went wrong. I did this, it didn't go out the way that I wanted it to. They did this, I wanted them to love me instead of someone else. Um, issues around the breakup of a relationship really put that high alert risk factor on someone potentially taking their life. And I know you said there's a several more. Why don't you just kind of tick off some of the rest of the other 14 warning signs? Okay. So school, workplace situations, kind of like possibly hostile work environments. Money. Money definitely is up there on mm -hmm. causes of why people can consider suicide. Family, friends, their support systems. Stress. Drinking and drugs. And then, uh, people will drink to feel better. And actually, um, alcohol is the best depressant you could ever possibly acquire. If you want to be depressed, go out and drink. It'll work. Um, anger, bullying, domestic violence, loss and grief, and that which leads to very unbearable pain medical situations, self-esteem, that feeling of hopelessness, and that, and living in a type of an author, authoritarian situation where you don't really get to express yourself or make decisions, someone else is making decisions for you. Mental health. If you're sick, you, you check with the doctor. You know, you might go see the doctor. The doctor might say, ooh, this isn't really good. We need to, you know, admit you to the hospital. You go to the hospital. Say you need some type of surgery and that. There's pre-op. There's the operating room. There's afterwards. There's in, you know, they wait until you're okay. Then you may go to a room. Then you have some type of rehab. Then you might go directly home. You've gone through a whole lot of steps. In mental health, we expect someone to turn around and without the benefit of the staging of the steps that it takes to go from when something happens until something's better is huge. And in mental health, we don't look at it. We want someone to be okay immediately. We have the least effective amount of understanding about how our brain works. And that is such a good analogy to, to put it right like just any other medical situation where we would go get help. We would talk to somebody about that. So let's say that somebody has asked that one question about, you know, something doesn't seem to be right. Are you thinking about suicide? If they say yes, then what do you do next? What is the next thing somebody should respond with? Well, it, if, you, if you're not sure what to do, you can call any hotline. You could just dial the operator. The operator will connect you with a hotline. Uh, they're changing the to uh, 988 or something like that so that you can get through to a crisis line quicker. Because um, what, what they need to do is they need to uh, determine and that does this person have a plan and that have they thought out what they would do? And that Do they have a how? Do they have a when? Do they have a where? And do they have the means? If someone says, I'm going to go, you know, tragically, oh my gosh, I lived in the Bay Area for a long time. And the, the history of people jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge is just tragic. Uh, but if someone says they're going to go somewhere and do something, you have, you're, what you're doing is calculating 
the amount of time that you have to intervene. And so if they have a plan that's, you know, if this doesn't get better, I'm going to go do X, Y, and Z is different than um, I can't take any more. I'm going, you know, home and I'm going to, you know, do something, take something and that and end my life. And that really requires fast action. I see. Good. And we've got the uh, hotline uh, number down below uh, that Great. people can call uh, and then the website uh, as well for people. Um, Sandy, you have a dedication in your writing that I think is so poignant. It reads, to all those who left the theater of life during intermission instead of waiting for the final curtain, and to all of those left to ponder why. And that is also a big challenge is for the people who are left, who don't know why or don't know uh, what happened uh, during that time. Sandy, could you read something uh, from your guidebook, please? Let me read just something on on the assessment part. Okay. And then so in um, so like I said, we want to know if they have a plan, if they if they have a how, a when, a where, the means that, and other things to be concerned about is have they ever done this before, and have they ever you know tr attempted to end their life? Did anybody even know? A lot of times, no one even knows that someone made an attempt. Has anyone they know talked about attempted or completed a suicide? Are they overly curious about death? Has there been a history of abuse? Have police or social services been involved? Resources. What type of resources do they have? And this is where people err a lot. Resources are what the person who's having a problem thinks are their resources, not what we think are their resources. No. Has there been, have social services, police, you know, anyone else had to try to help them? Um, who do they think cares? No. Are they in therapy? When is their next appointment? When was the last appointment? Did they miss an appointment? Do they need someone to go with them and, and just hold their hand and, and be there and help explain what's going on? Now, and that for teenagers, it's is there a trusted adult in their life? Um, oh my gosh, the, the whole teenage situation is so sad. It's on the menu so much earlier and it and it gets acted on so much earlier. Does it? I see. That, that is just tragic, like you said, that when it happens to teenagers, too. Now, you are doing workshops, though, for teens and for families and for companies and for schools. Um, yes. Tell us a little bit about how those workshops uh, work. What, what do they look like for you? Um, I have an assortment of different types of workshops, but my goal for any workshop that I ever do is so that people find something that they value about themselves that they might not have thought about before. And whether that is something in the area where things are so bad, they're thinking about suicide. Um, I have a workshop coming up um, in November about money. Uh, money is, I think, about the, the third cause of why somebody might contemplate suicide um, and why people get divorced. Uh, so, and I actually, I have uh, a handout that's on my website that anybody who wants to, you know, just kind of sign up to get notices of different things going on, and that can download the handout. Great, great. Okay, and we'll give your web website here in just a minute, too. That's good to know. And you're also going to be assisting with a huge suicide prevention session for high school students after the first of the year, and this is something you have done in the past where there's thousands of kids, uh, they're usually it, it, it's taken part usually in a university, but this year it's going to be uh, virtual, right, yeah. on Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. So what all what all will be involved uh, in that session for high school students? No. Uh, it will be accessible, you know, nationally, internationally. Anybody who wants to come, since we'll be on Zoom, it's called Stand Up, Speak Up, Save a Life. And I just remember that you can Google Stand Up, Speak Up, Save a Life conference for youth conference. That um, I've been part, it's been going on for five years. I've been part of it for four years. It, it's the most 
amazing and wonderful conference. Um, youth themselves uh, locally from different high schools have been leaders of groups. Um, it's, it's really geared toward engaging youth to recognize signs and help each other, help themselves and help each other. And help their peers. Absolutely. That is critical. Um, now, on the lighter side, you are also uh, writing a children's book about your brother and his cat. What's the, what's the basic story behind that? I have a brother who, who bless his heart, has had some um, physical and health challenges all of his life. And he um, has, he's had cats over the years. I remember 18 and a half years ago taking him to pick out his first cat. And when he, and he lives alone, and it's lonely to live alone. And so he has had some really amazing cats, and he sometimes also has seizures. And one night he was having a bad seizure. He like fell out of bed and woke up to the cat biting his toes. And he felt for him, it was the cat helping him, you know, letting him know that, you know, you're here, you're okay. I'm just biting your toes to remind you that everything's okay. And before he knew it, he got a phone call from the, um, one of the pet societies and um, one of the like big national pet societies. And it turns out that the cat was nominated for cat of the year for doing this. And then a couple months later, they found out that he won. And they, my brother, I know, and the cat went to New York and he got this award. And it, it was just amazing. That, so the and, cat actually helped him come back from this seizure. The, the cat actually helped him. I, I think that's going to be a wonderful story, too. So um, I love what you said about value. And I hope if anybody's watching who has any questions, you do need to find the value in yourself and there is that value there and if you can't find it we need to tell people how much they are valued and how much they are loved so you can contact sandy through her website at sandyroberts.com and that's s-a-n-d-e roberts.com and you can also find out more about her workshops there as well as the big high school program coming up after the first of the year and you'll have all of her contact information there as well. Thank you so much for being with us today, Sandy. Great information. Oh, thank you, Lori. It was my honor. Straight ahead, our featured nonprofit and upcoming arts events. Don't go away. AZ Creates highlights the Sonoran Arts League, a nonprofit 501c3 volunteer based arts service organization dedicated to actively advancing art, artists, and art education, with more than 800 members from around the United States and Canada. Home of Hidden in the Hills Studio Tour, which runs November 20th, 21st, and 22nd, and 27th, 28th, and 29th, the League's mission is to give the community, by promoting art, artists, and art education, through leadership and service in the belief that an artistic awareness is essential to the well-being of life and the community. The League has a special focus on mentoring youth, believing that arts training helps develop the abilities to focus and strengthens cognitive skills in young people. The League fosters artistic growth with scholarship awards for graduating seniors, incentive awards and art supplies, art experiences and field trips, art workshops, educational programs, and youth art exhibits in Art in Public Places. For information, visit SonoranArtsLeague.org. We all need something to look forward to these days, so we found a variety of virtual and in-person arts events for you from around the state. Here's AZ Creates co-host, Kathy Beard. Hey there, Lori. From dance to bluegrass, fairy parties, and art festivals geared to get your holiday shopping off to a creative start. We found some great events starting this November all throughout Arizona. So mark your calendars as we explore these unique online and in-person activities. Set in front of the picturesque Superstition Mountains is the 14th Annual Artists of the Superstitions Annual Fall Studio Tour. Saturday and Sunday, November 7th and 8th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. in Apache Junction. 
featuring 50 artists in 14 studios. Take a delightfully cool stroll through everything from unique locally handcrafted wearable art to home decor, including copper, fabric, glass, jewelry, painting, wood, photography, pottery, sculpture, and more. For more details, visit the website at artistsofthesuperstitions.com. The annual Canal Convergence Art Experience, featuring temporary light-based public artworks with creative workshops, performances, and educational artist talks, will combine in-person and virtual presentations in 2020 due to the pandemic. The event at the Scottsdale Waterfront runs November 6th through 15th with the theme Reconnect and challenges artists to focus on water, light, sustainability, and water conservation. Check for virtual events on their Facebook page at Canal Convergence or visit the website at canalconvergence.com for more details. Contemporary dancers explore connection freedom, and celebration through expressive movement during the Parking Lot Dance Project in the upper level of Scottsdale Civic Center's parking garage. The Movement Source Dance Company performs to music by Drew Bowman in a very creative way during the pandemic. You can enjoy viewing this innovative 30-minute performance safely from your car, and masks are required. It will be held from 7 to 7.30 p.m., Friday and Saturday, November 13th and 14th. Visit the Scottsdale Performing Arts website for important vehicle information at scottsdaleperformingarts.org. The popular Fountain Festival of Fine Arts and Crafts in Fountain Hills is still being planned as normal, and organizers have taken measures to reduce the spread of COVID-19 to keep everyone safe at the event. It will take place November 13th through 15th and will include a variety of artists, music, food, and more. But before you go, make sure to visit the website's COVID-19 resource page in case anything changes. You'll find more location information and hours at FountainHillsArtFairs.com. The 41st Annual Bluegrass Festival and Fiddle Championship in Wickenburg is returning November 13th through 15th at the Everett Bowman Rodeo Grounds less than a mile from downtown. The festival includes two toe-tapping bands and competitions in fiddle, mandolin, flat pick guitar, and banjo with prizes and cash awards. There will also be food and drink concessions, a beer booth, and arts and crafts vendors on Saturday and Sunday with COVID-19 restrictions in place, including temperature checks, social distancing markers, and waivers at the admission gates. Go to outwickenburgway.com for all the details. The Magic Moments Holiday Arts and Crafts Boutique is online this year and running now through November 15th on their Facebook page. Handcrafted items by Arizona artisans include a variety of mediums for all occasions with a portion of the proceeds from member sales benefiting a variety of charities. Search on Facebook for Magic Moments Boutique. Art Attack AZ is holding a variety of in-person arts and crafts events in Southern Arizona this month in Tucson, Catalina, and Green Valley. The white tent shows are typically in shopping centers, with Silverbill Arts and Crafts Festival in Tucson, November 6 through 8, Catalina, November 13 through 15, and Green Valley, November 21st and 22nd. Check the website for hours at artattackaz.com. The underground pop-up art show in the Deuce in Phoenix is back with the Phoenix Pancakes and Booze Art Show, November 20th and 21st. The age 21 and older event includes more than 75 local artists exhibiting some 300 pieces of artwork, along with free all-you-can-eat pancakes, live audio performances from local DJs and music producers, and live body painting and art. Get the scoop at pancakesandbooze.com. Check out Junk in the Trunk, a pop-up show at the market in Scottsdale Quarter, now through December. A collection of vintage curators, handmade artisans, and local small businesses will take part offering jewelry, furnishings, florals, antiques, and more. Get the exact address and hours at junkinthetrunkvintagemarket.com and click on the pop-up markets. It's a Fall Fairy Garden Party Saturday, November 21st, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. The informal picnic-style event is at the Teapot in Phoenix, with tea, 
food, boutique shopping, handmade crafts, and loads of fairy fun. Dress up is optional and fun for all ages with free general admission. Search for the Fall Fairy Garden Party event on Facebook for more details. Tune in and watch an online studio violin performance of Virtual Theater Kids Black Violin now through December 15 through the Chandler Center for the Arts. The 40-minute multi-camera program will include a question and answer section along with a study guide. Black Violin is led by two classically trained string players and their band, blending classical and hip-hop music to overcome stereotypes while encouraging people of all ages, races, and economic backgrounds to join together to break down cultural barriers. Visit the Chandler Center for the Arts website at chandlercenter.org and search for Black Violin. With the rise in COVID-19 cases, Please be sure to wear your masks and practice social distancing so you and everyone you know can stay safe and healthy for the upcoming holidays. If you have a creative event, contact us by email at azcreates.artonlineaz at gmail.com so everyone can have something to look forward to. Great information, Kathy. Thanks. AZ Creates is sponsored by the Santan Sun News, a twice-monthly community publication with a circulation of more than 35,000 serving the residents of Southern Chandler. Owned and operated by the Times Media Group, the Santan Sun News includes relentlessly local coverage of community, business, arts, youth, and much more news and information. Read it online at www.santansun.com. In our next episode of AZ Create, you'll meet doll maker and resin artist Mary Poindexter in our Creative Connection segment. And in What Are You Reading? you'll meet sci-fi writer William X. Adams, and he spells it P-S-I-Fi, and you'll have to check the show out to find out why. As we close this show, and thank you for joining us today, we found a quote that combines art and gratefulness. The German philosopher, cultural critic, composer, and poet Friedrich Nietzsche said, The essence of all beautiful art, all great art, is gratitude. Please tell us what you thought about the show by leaving us a comment in the little section below, if you would. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to be notified of when the next show is about ready to air in a couple of weeks, click the little bell and then that will let you know when the next show is ready. There is also a share tab where you can send this to anyone, friends, family, artists, art collectors, anyone literally around the world, anybody you think might be interested in finding out about great arts and artists in Arizona. If you're on Facebook and Instagram, we would love it if you would like our page there. It's Art Online AZ on Facebook and Instagram. Again, Art online AZ, and we promote art and artists there as well. Meanwhile, we're so grateful for your support and for watching our show, so please stay safe and healthy and make it a creative day. See you next time.